host, Anna Domino, and welcome to episode 19 of the Crime Bistro Podcast. This show gazes into the thrillingly twisted world of true crime, examining real cases while we share in a passion for crime and coffee alike. For this episode, I'm enjoying a hot green tea, so grab yourself a fresh brew and let's get into the strange disappearance of Brandon Lawson. Brandon Lawson was only 26 years old when he went missing on August 9th of 2013. That night, he had gotten into a fight with his common-law wife, Ledessa, and left their home. When his truck ran out of gas, he called his brother and asked him to bring him a gas can. When Kyle got there, however, Brandon was nowhere to be seen. They were speaking on the phone when a police officer pulled up behind Brandon's truck, and Brandon said to Kyle, quote, one time, run, end quote. As Kyle would later explain, this meant between the two of them, quote, law enforcement, run, end quote. This means that Brandon was close enough to see what was happening at the truck, but that no one ever saw him. Kyle didn't run, and Brandon hung up on his brother. That phone call would be the last time anyone heard from Brandon Lawson since. Brandon Mason Lawson was born on November 18th of 1986. At the time that he went missing, Brandon was living in a house in San Angelo, Texas, with his common-law wife, Ladessa Lofton, and the two had been together for 10 years. They had met in high school while Ladessa was a sophomore, and Brandon was a junior. He approached her in the hallway and asked her to write down her phone number. Ladessa says that she fell in love with Brandon's personality and his striking blue eyes. Family was very important to the two of them, and they enjoyed doing things like watching movies, camping, and fishing quote, living life to the fullest, end quote, as Ladessa has said. The two had three children together, and Ladessa was the stepmother to Brandon's oldest daughter. Around the time that Brandon disappeared, however, their relationship was becoming quite strained. The two were very stressed, as Brandon was working over 60 hours a week, with four kids in the house, their youngest being only a few months old. And at the time, Brandon was working in the oil industry to support the family. On August 8th of 2013, Brandon returned home briefly after not coming home the night before. At approximately 10.45 to 11 p.m., Brandon and Ladessa got into an argument, which Ladessa says started because she believed that Brandon was on drugs as he had experienced a recent relapse and she told him to get out. Kyle, Brandon's brother, later confirmed that Brandon had done methamphetamines prior to his disappearance and had ongoing substance issues but had been clean for six months. Brandon did leave at 11.53 p.m., and it is believed that he was going to his dad's house, which is near Fort Worth, Texas, in a town called Crowley, almost a four-hour drive away. This is based on a call that he had with his father around 11.30, and apparently his father had tried to convince Brandon to stay home for the night, but he did not. In the very early hours of August 9th, 2013, at approximately 12.30 a.m., Brandon called Kyle to say that he had run out of gas while driving on U.S. Highway 277 toward Bronte, Texas. Bronte was a very small West Texas town with a population of just about a 1,000 people, and a deputy described the area as being so desolate that one could lie down in the middle of the road and not worry about getting run over. This initial call between Brandon and Kyle was definitely odd, and Kyle said his brother had told him, quote, three expletives are chasing me out of town, end quote, when Brandon said it was, quote, the Mexicans in the neighborhood, end quote. Kyle then asked if drugs were causing him hallucinations, which Brandon did deny. Kyle had his girlfriend Audrey and his four-year-old son in the car at the time, so they all headed over to Ladessa's to pick up a gas can in order to go help Brandon and Brandon himself called 911 at 12.50 a.m. This call has a series of statements in it that are very unclear and hard to make out, but Brandon did tell the dispatcher that he ran out of gas, that he was in the middle of a field, that he needed help, and then he asked, please hurry. The dispatcher asked Brandon if he needed an ambulance, and he said, quote, no, I need the cops, end quote. Some people believe that they can hear gunshots in the background of the call, however, Kyle believes that that's only the noise of cars driving on the bridge over the Colorado River. I have listened to the call myself, and I can't make out any more than others have been able to. However, it does sound like he is referencing another person on the call. At one point, the transcript says, quote, I ran into them, end quote, and at another point, the words, quote, the first guy, end quote, can be made out, which is interesting to note. The important thing to take away from this 911 call, however unclear it is, is that Brandon did specifically ask for the police to come. 
The brothers did keep making calls to one another, but Kyle said that Brandon would only ever say about a sentence or two before hanging up every time, and this was only made worse by its body's service in the area, but according to the source that I found, the phone records show the following. At 12.51, Kyle left a voicemail for Brandon, and also at 12.51, Brandon called Ledessa, but she didn't answer. At 12.52, Kyle's girlfriend called Brandon twice, and Kyle called at 12.54. At 12.58, Brandon called Kyle twice, and at 12.59, Kyle called Brandon. At about 12.58 a.m., a passing truck driver called 911 and reported seeing Brandon's abandoned F-150 on the side of the highway parked in a hazardous manner with the tail end hanging over the white line. At 1.04 a.m., the 911 dispatcher called Brandon back, trying to get more information, and she left a voicemail before calling once again, but he never answered. Brandon called Kyle twice at 1.15, which were the last calls that he made from his phone. At 1.18 a.m., Kyle asked Brandon for his exact location, and on this call, Kyle said that Brandon sounded like he was out of breath, like he was running, and he claimed that he was bleeding. He told them to hurry, and then he hung up, and it was at 1.19 a.m. that all of the calls made to Brandon's phone started to go straight to voicemail. Prior to this final conversation, at approximately 1.10 a.m. was when Kyle and Audrey arrived at Brandon's truck to find that he was not in the vehicle, and the responding officer did arrive at about the same time. Brandon's truck was out of gas, however, so the initial phone call that he was out of gas was legitimate, and there was no visible damage to the truck. He was on the phone with Brandon at the time, and during that phone call, while the officer named Deputy Neal had responded to the scene, once the officer arrived, Brandon said, quote, one time, run, end quote, which Kyle did later explain that was a message between the two of them, understood to mean, quote, law enforcement, run, end quote, as a kind of warning. Kyle responded that he was not going to run, to which Brandon said, quote, where is your pride, end quote, and then abruptly hung up. Brandon did have an outstanding warrant for possession with intent to deliver in Johnson County, and Kyle believed that this was the reason that Brandon was hiding from the officer who had responded. At the time, Kyle didn't know that Brandon had made that 911 call, and he had no way of knowing how serious this situation was. When Brandon had told Kyle he was bleeding, Kyle assumed that it was because he had tripped or run into something. He had no reason to believe that it was the result of an attack or something more sinister, or that his brother could possibly be missing. The responding officer did know about the call. However, it was dispatched as a motorist who ran out of gas, and not as someone who was under duress and needed help. The details surrounding the time from 1.30 to 4.30 a.m. are pretty unclear, However, after talking with Deputy Neal, Kyle decided that he was going to drive away and park up the road to see if his brother would return once the officer left. Kyle said, quote, I sat there for a good 30 to 45 minutes, end quote, but he had to eventually leave since his son was hungry and crying. Kyle's paycheck had not been deposited yet, so he wasn't able to fill the gas can himself that he had brought, so he just left it in the bed of Brandon's truck, thinking that Brandon could walk to a gas station and fill it himself. It was approximately 4 o'clock a.m. when Ledessa woke up to several missed calls from Kyle, Brandon, and Brandon's mom. Her phone had been in her van since the only charger she had at the time was a car charger, so she had not seen any of the messages previously. She tried to call Brandon back, but all she got was continuous ringing from his line, so she just assumed that he didn't have service. Eventually, she was able to speak to Kyle, who told her that he was at the truck, but that they hadn't been able to find Brandon himself. Kyle returned to the pickup at around 5 o'clock a.m., and Brandon was still nowhere to be found. At this point, Kyle's check had gone through, so he was able to fill up the gas can and bring it back. However, he was starting to get seriously concerned about his brother. It was starting to seem like something was very wrong, and that Brandon wasn't just hiding from police. It was approximately 8.30 to 9 o'clock a.m. when the sheriff's department had Brandon's truck towed since it was over the white line and Brandon was the only one who had a key. At the time that Brandon went missing, he was 5'9", weighing about 230 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. He was wearing a yellow shirt, camouflage shorts, and white Nike Air Max sneakers, and he also has multiple tattoos on his neck, back, and chest.
The area where Brandon disappeared has been searched many times, both on foot and from a bird's eye view. This terrain where he disappeared is extremely rough, spotted green by thorny mesquite and cactus, and known to be inhabited by wild hogs and by rattlesnakes. The area was also fairly desolate. The family has shared a video of the exact place where the truck was found, and in that video only the road and the surrounding wilderness can be seen, no businesses, houses, or even other cars on the highway. Brandon was right next to the Colorado River, which had been experiencing severe droughts at the time, and it was only knee-deep at its highest. Thermal imaging cameras, plane searches, and cadaver dogs were all used in the days after he disappeared, and a private investigator that the Lawsons later hired also conducted a helicopter search. None of Brandon's items, which weren't in the truck, his phone, keys, or wallet, have ever been recovered. On August 11th, there was one spot noticed underneath a tree that appeared to have indentation marks, which the sheriff said it's possible that Brandon had crouched there to watch Kyle and the officer at his truck. However, it has also been noted that no signs of a struggle had been found. The day after Brandon went missing, Deputy Neal checked the homes and properties of owners who were gone in the area. Since many people around that town were seasonal residents, he was hoping to see signs of disturbance that would point to Brandon being at one of the properties, but he didn't find anything. On August 12th, Texas Ranger Lt. Dwayne Gall met with Deputy Neal and Cook County Sheriff Wayne McCutcheon about the case, and they concluded, quote, that Lawson is possibly no longer in Cook County, but would see about making arrangements on the availability of a DPS helicopter, end quote. It was on Tuesday, August 13th, that an official missing persons report for Brandon was filed by Ladessa, and on that same day, Texas Ranger Nick Hanna, who now leads the case, came to Coke County to take a helicopter ride over the area from the Colorado River south and along both sides of US-277 near where the truck was. After this, quote, it was determined that Lawson was not on the ground, due to the fact that there was a lot of exposed bare ground even under the short mesquite and cedar bushes, end quote. In order to rule out the possibility that Brandon had gotten lost in the brush and died, Coke County approved a search using cadaver dogs on Thursday, October 24th of 2013, using an organization called Texar, who has a 95% success rate. However, even with the search area being extended after one dog showed slight interest, nothing was found. This doesn't rule out the possibility that he is in the area, however, it just does make it unlikely. Unfortunately, much of the land in the surrounding area was private, so the actual search area was pretty restricted because of this. The investigation showed that Brandon had been experiencing some sort of paranoia on the day that he went missing, and that he had told Kyle that Ladessa, quote, had people from the neighborhood after him, end quote a quote which references Brandon's very first call to Kyle when he told him he needed the gas. Ladessa has said that she has no idea why Brandon would have said such a thing, and Kyle remains adamant that this was only the result of some sort of paranoia. Law enforcement was initially suspicious of Kyle, thinking that he was somehow involved either by helping Brandon run away or through foul play. Kyle did agree to take a polygraph and was administered two, both of which he did pass. According to a San Angelo news article, Brandon withdrew from his 401k before his disappearance, and this was confirmed by Ladessa. However, she was unaware of whether or not he had actually ever received the money. His last paycheck was direct deposited on the night that he went missing, and Brandon never withdrew that money. There has also been no activity on any of his accounts since that night, his bank account, or his cell phone. There were a couple of mishandlings in this case, including the 911 call that Brandon had made. Brandon went missing on a Thursday, and his family was made unaware of the call until the following Tuesday. And even from there, it took four to five months for them to receive the recording. The only reason that they even found out about the call at all was because Ladessa ordered a phone log from Verizon and saw that it had been made. Additionally, Brandon's truck was not properly processed until it was impounded, since police didn't consider him a missing person at first. When it was searched, no blood was found, which is largely the reason why police don't believe that foul play is involved. In a case with so little evidence such as this, there is a lot of room for different theories to arise, which is exactly what has happened for Brandon. 
Deputy Neal of the Coke County Sheriff's Office believes that Brandon walked back to the highway and was able to get a ride somewhere else. And unanimously, law enforcement believes that foul play was not a factor in this case, and that if Brandon were still in Coke County, a body would have been recovered by now. Those who think that Brandon ran away think that he was motivated either by his outstanding warrant or the issues that were arising in his relationship, and that he's now living a new life somewhere else. However, it is really important to remember that during the 911 call Brandon made, he specifically asked for police, so if he were to then run from the responding officer, that wouldn't make much sense. An odd thing to note about this is that on the missing Brandon Lawson website, which will be linked in the show notes, a missing persons poster is posted from the Texas Department of Public Safety, and the poster reads that the case type is involuntary, referring to Brandon being missing under involuntary circumstances, which is the exact opposite of what law enforcement have been putting out. The Lawson family completely disagrees with law enforcement, and they believe that foul play had to have been involved. They firmly believe that Brandon never would have just left his family, especially his kids who he was extremely dedicated to. Kyle adamantly denies that his brother had been hallucinating from drugs, and several members of the family backed this up. His father corroborated that Brandon had been clean for six months, and a cousin of Brandon's named Anthony said that Brandon had once mentioned to him how much he was enjoying sobriety. Many feel that the 911 call Brandon placed does indicate that there was foul play, especially since Brandon's remains and possessions have never been recovered. Brandon's father, Brad, is conflicted about what happened to his son, sometimes believing that the chances of him being alive are slim, and sometimes fearing that Brandon is alive in some sort of horrible situation such as forced labor. He is, however, adamant that Brandon was harmed, saying, quote, something happened that night and it wasn't him meeting a girl and driving off somewhere, end quote. Despite the difficulty in his relationship, Brandon loved his family, and those close to him believed that he would never have just walked away. Not to mention, at the time, Brandon was actively making plans for his future, and he had gotten a new job that he was supposed to start the next Monday after he went missing, with a better salary and benefits. Brad also asks a very important question, quote, How far could he actually have gone in that terrain? How far can a man have gone in a pair of shorts without any water or anything to drink? End quote. If Brandon were intentionally harmed, there are so many possibilities for how this happened. He may have been being followed, perhaps accidentally trespassed onto the wrong person's land, or fallen victim to a crime of random opportunity. Other people still have wondered if he or someone he knew was in trouble with a drug dealer, but there isn't any evidence to show that he was still involved with drugs in any capacity, and there is no reason to tarnish his name without having that evidence. Still others think that the 911 recording was the result of a drug-induced mania and believe that Brandon simply succumbed to the terrain and that search efforts just failed to find him, but again, there is no evidence of drugs. He could have also come across a wild animal, however, in the 911 call, it seems like he was referring to another person or people, rather than an animal attacking. There have been some conspiracies that have arisen regarding law enforcement in this case, and Brandon's cousin Anthony has presented a theory of his own, believing that the 911 call was doctored before it was released. He cites the fact that there are no identifiers on the call, Neither Brandon or the dispatcher identify themselves during it, which is an interesting point, but nearly impossible to confirm or throw out. A private investigator named Paula Bordeaux has said, quote, It's a tough case. People always want to blame it on law enforcement, that they didn't do a good job. They only have so many resources, just like me, end quote. Today, what remains of the night that Brandon went missing is a red and white metal cross about three feet tall, marking the spot where his truck was found. Every few months, the six-person office of the Coke County Sheriff receives a call from someone looking for information about Brandon's disappearance, to which they are told that the case is dead. According to Chief Deputy Brandon Neal, quote, we have nothing, nothing, end quote. The Lawson family maintains that they believe something happened to Brandon, as Kyle has said, quote, my brother might have been a felon and might have messed with drugs and he might have relapsed, but my brother worked hard for what he had. He loved his children, he took care of his children, he was a good person. He wasn't some dope fiend living on the streets, 
robbing people or trying to get over on someone to get high again, end quote. Ledessa and their children have been struggling with the lack of answers in this case for years, as she has said, quote, for a long time, I blamed myself, end quote. She has also spoken about regretting their fight on the night that he went missing, saying, quote, I'll never get those words back, end quote. As is the unfortunate case with most instances of missing persons, there is such a lack of evidence here that it is difficult to imagine there ever being a conclusive answer. However, this case is more unique in the sense that there is such a lack of evidence that it cannot even be determined whether or not foul play was a factor, which has left it open for many theories and speculations. Personally, I don't have any idea what happened to Brandon. However, I do agree with his family that Brandon's disappearance was not a voluntary happening. Having listened to the 911 call myself several times, I do believe that he specifically mentioned another person more than once, and the fact that he specifically asked for the police is the most convincing factor for me. Whether or not he had an outstanding warrant that he was afraid of getting in trouble for, I believe that something on that night scared Brandon enough that he decided calling the police was his only option in trying to keep himself safe. Whether someone perhaps approached him in the truck and attacked him as a crime of opportunity, or someone had been following him that night with bad intentions, I cannot say, but I don't think this case is as simple as Brandon choosing to run away. With that being said, anyone who has any information about Brandon Lawson is urged to call the Coke County Sheriff's Office at 325-453-2717, and for anyone who is interested in supporting the family, they are currently running a Facebook page titled Help Find Brandon Lawson, which will be linked in the show notes for this episode. The last update posted to this page was on Christmas Day of 2021, reading, quote, the Christmas season may come and go, but our love for you lives forever, end quote. Brandon's family has not given up on trying to find answers, and so neither should the rest of us. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crime Bistro podcast, and if you are interested in learning more about the disappearance of Brandon Lawson, all of the sources are listed in the show notes at crimebistro.com. If you have a theory of your own to share, feel free to head over and visit the podcast on YouTube, or on Instagram at Crime Bistro Podcast to leave a comment and see some behind-the-scenes updates on the episodes to come. With that, this story is coming to a close, so thanks again, and as always, until next time.